good to have you all here and a special welcome to John Vinheisen. Now, John and I spent a lot of time beforehand kind of reciting our paranoias. And so we're a little spooked by these doors up here. So if anybody starts coming through those doors, just kind of wave and uh, we'll, we'll look for answers up there. So um, other than that, we are ready to go. So um, John, we're, um, we know you're from the area, uh, that uh, you're a Trinity alum, but tell us a little bit about um, that you're, you have local roots and, and what it was like to be a Trinity student here just a few years ago. Yeah, uh, well, welcome. Thanks for having me. Um, <laughs> you want the truth? You want me to make up a story? <laughs> so I didn't actually want to come here. Uh, I went to high school across the street and spent four years saying there's no way I'm going there. Uh, and uh, dreamed probably every day since I was two of getting a scholarship at a big time school. And uh, once I blew my knee out my senior year, those schools stopped talking to me. So um, I kind of ended up here, frankly, because mm -hmm. uh, I had a lot of buddies that went here. But in hindsight, while that was a lot of pain at the time, um, I'm sure glad it worked out that way. Cool. What did you experience here? Trinity was a smaller place, but um, what did you find that uh, you benefited from? What I find interesting now versus a lot of the kids I see coming out of school to start to work for us is uh, I actually knew my professors. Mm -hmm. uh, they taught me stuff. Didn't have student aides. So uh, the intimacy of having a small student to professor ratio is uh, more exceptional than I thought. Yeah, good. Now, somehow, from Trinity, you ended up in Ace Hardware. What was that journey? What, um, what drew you to Ace and the like? So I was at an ad agency after I graduated here for just a little while, and then I ended up at Ace. And you know, I, I, I've just been fortunate to get a lot of different challenges and a lot of different opportunities. Um, I'm painfully aware that there's some guy in his garage in Cleveland right now who's unemployed that could do my job better than me. So a lot of it's luck and timing and blessing and whatnot, but probably what's kept me there is it's given me the opportunity to compete at what I see as a high level. And I love showing up, like a lot of us do at Ace, with a chip on our shoulder. Uh, we're the underdog. We go up against some of the biggest, baddest, most well-funded, well-capitalized companies on the face of the earth. There's uh, periods of the year where Home Depot or Lowe's will have more cash in the bank than we'll sell in a quarter. Uh, it's David and Goliath at its finest. Mm -hmm. And uh, for those of you sorry sacks that aren't up on your Old Testament, uh, you know, David wins that fight, and we plan to as well. <laughs> Good. Well, um, with talking about the competition, I know that your student team understands ACE and its alternative structure and the like, but if you could share with this group why ACE is different. Yeah, we, we're very similar to a lot of big companies in the way we're governed and structured and board and all some of those bureaucracies you hate but you get stuck with. But uh, fundamentally, there's two differences. We are a cooperative, which means that there are two things that we have to do that uh, most don't. Uh, one is we have a lot of shareholders, like many do, of companies of our size, but our only shareholders have to be store owners. Mm -hmm. So we have 4,850 of those stores around the world, and they are the only shareholders of the corporation. Unlike a Home Depot or Lowe's, you could buy a stock today. You can't buy stock in Ace unless you own a store. Mm -hmm. And then uh, a cooperative structure is merely just another section within, within the IRS tax code, that real thin document we all understand so well. <laughs> um, you could be an LLC, an S Corp, a C Corp, and we happen to be a cooperative. That means we have to distribute meaningfully all of our profits at the end of the year back to our shareholders. Uh, and we do that in the form of stock and cash. 40% of that is cash, 60% of it is stock that we keep and run the company on, uh, which means we pay no tax. And uh, the poor individual ace retailers who get stuck with that bill pay all the tax. So that is a requirement by law in order to be a cooperative. Mm -hmm. It's, it's cool. unique in many regards, yeah. but, but I'll tell you one thing that's very positive about it. Uh, whenever people ask me about ACE's business and what we do, I usually try to rattle off a bunch of statistics that I think they'll find impressive, you know, what our sales are and how many stores we have and how many distribution centers. But in the end, I'll tell them, you know, you'll never remember any of that. Uh, in the end, our business is about serving others, and we feel blessed to be in that business. And when your shareholder is also your customer, it gets very hard to lose sight of who it is you're serving. In that regard, it's very positive. Wow. Yes. Now, you've met with this um, student team before, and I, I was in on the conference call that you were, had just a week or two ago, and you talked about, because of that cooperative structure, it, it requires you to be a certain kind of leader. Talk a little bit about that as the CEO. Yeah. Um, well, I think, I think the, the team awkwardly asked me, what kind of leader are you? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you probably have to ask somebody else about that, because... Uh, you know, I'm probably the last person to ask, but I think I use the word trying to be motivational and inspiring. Um, 
Now, there's a difference between aspiring to be motivational and aspiring <laughs> and actually being it. Um, but I think the answer to that is what every leader ought to answer. Mm -hmm. By definition, a leader needs to motivate and inspire other people. Uh, there's lots of roles, there's lots of gifts, whether it be education, church, or business. Mm -hmm. But uh, think of a church that's led by just a teacher, and there's lots of them. You'll typically see a void because a teacher, by definition, is to what? Educate and edify. Very important. But leaders need to inspire and motivate other people to go do something. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm not doing that on a regular basis, uh, they need to put somebody else in the seat. Okay. Is that unique to a cooperative structure or is that across the board? I don't believe the idea of trying to motivate others towards some sort of a cause is unique to the cooperative. Um, what may be unique to the cooperative is that we're probably more like a church in some regards than we are a business because we have a lot of low, no leverage leadership. Uh, I think leading a church is probably the hardest, most difficult form of leadership you could possibly have because what are you going to do when things don't go your way? What are you going to do? Cut their salary? They're all volunteers. <laughs> Take away their cell phone, their company car? They don't have that. Um, our shareholder is our customer. And so in many regards, you've got to lead without leverage. It's not like a McDonald's franchise where if they don't put the coffee in, we told them, we just pull the plug. We don't do that. Um, so it requires a little bit more of a servant leadership, in my opinion. But the idea of being motivating and inspiring to get people to go somewhere that's the stuff of leadership in my view. Okay. So leading without leverage, servant leadership. Many of us have read Jim Collins' book about the different levels of leadership. He has level five, which talks about personal resolve and humility. Level four is the, the effective executive. Level three, the competent manager. So tell, tell us how those things come into play for you. Yeah. Well, I'm definitely a level five leader because I'm so humble about my leadership. In fact, I'm very proud of my humility. Um, just kidding. Um, yeah, it's a great book and it talks, I, I love the fact that in that book, you know, they were trying to study what makes great companies mm -hmm. great. And it was basically college students doing all the work, you know, and then the guy at the top gets all the credit. You probably know how that works. So he basically told them 10 times, don't come back to me with leadership. I don't want to hear it. Everybody says that and it just kept coming back, kept coming back. Mm -hmm. And regardless of my own personal style, who cares? I think a leader of any organization has got to do a couple of things that will help you on his pyramid of, of great leadership. Mm -hmm. um, you've got to answer on a regular basis four or five absolutely critical questions that everybody's asking, even though they may never say mm -hmm. it. And that is, where am I going? Where are we going? How are we going to get there? Are we making any progress? And like, how do I participate in advancing the cause? If, if a leader's not regularly articulating those things, I, I think they're going to probably have some problems. Because over time, people subconsciously are asking themselves that. If they don't hear this, the, the answer to where are we going, what's the point of all this, and how are we going to get there, and how do I do, you know, what do I do to advance it, uh, they're going to have some issues. Mm -hmm. And then personally, a question I always like asking uh, business leaders, I, I will often ask this of our stores who lead their own businesses in their local communities, what do you stand for more than just making money? The answers are often comical because there's rarely a thought given to it. So I think as a leader, and I think Collins talks about this in different words, uh, his parlance is different, but those answers have got to be articulated clearly by the leader or the organization over time I think is going to have some trouble. Mm -hmm. So there are probably people in your organization that want to be a leader. You know, they aspire to be a leader. Um, how does that happen within your structure? And how do you figure out who has those gifts and abilities? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. And uh, I'll, I'll say one thing out of the box. Lots of people that work in any organization aspire to leadership. Mm -hmm. But my experience is that most of them have no business being in leadership. They just aspire to it because the title supervisor, manager, director, or vice president comes with more money. <laughs> and very often organizations, myself included, I've done this a number of times and embarrassed by it, uh, in order to reward people that are doing great job individually, we promote them and then inflict them on other people as leaders. And so as a starting point, we try to define what it is. Everybody likes to talk about leadership. Could there be another stinking book written about leadership? I mean, it's ad nauseum, and I've read them all, believe me. Um, but what is it? Mm -hmm. So. There's a lot of good definitions, but I've stolen one from Marcus Buckingham years ago that I like, and that is a leader needs to rally people toward a better future. And that it involves three important points that if you're not doing, you're not a leader. One is it's about people, which suddenly means your individual contribution doesn't matter as much because it's about others. And then the idea of rallying, galvanizing, motivating, inspiring people to go somewhere, mm -hmm. to, to get somewhere. And each organization has its own cause. 
but a leader's job is to get them there. And so we try to define it. And then often what I'll do ad nauseum is I'll talk about at, our, at ACE, like if you want to be promoted, if you want to get ahead, think of it this way. When you're in school, you needed to get A's and B's. But here you need to do C's, D's, and E's. First, the three C's. You've got to have character, competence, and chemistry. And we talk about you know, your character. I need to be able to trust you, et cetera, et cetera. I preach to them, and they get sick of it. Uh, You've got to have competence. You've got to be good at what you do. You can't just be nice. You can't just be a good person. My mom's a good person, but she couldn't lead the company. Uh, and you need to have chemistry. You've got to be able to work with other people and get along and go somewhere. Then the D's. If you now are aspiring to lead others, you better have drive, desire, and determination. You've got to have a fire in the belly. I've got to be able to see that you want to win so badly you'll die for loose balls. And then the four E's. You've got to have energy. I don't want to have to kick you in the butt every time we need to get something done. You've got to be self-motivated, but you're a leader, so you better be able to energize others. Mm -hmm. And then you've got to execute. You've got to get it done. And you've got to have an edge. I don't mean edgy. There's lots of people at Ace <laughs> that are edgy. But you've got to have an edge, mm -hmm. right? Because leadership's a tough call sometimes. Mm -hmm. And after I do that, and it's way longer and more boring than that, um, I'll often say, now, some of you, your hearts are racing. And some of you are sinking in your chair because you realize none of that stuff is of interest to you. And that's where I get into the very unpopular discussion about, I think, some leadership, the born versus made comment, the mm -hmm. argument. Um, I think leaders are, are born. Now, everybody can improve their leadership. But if I'm a 2 on a scale of 1 to 10, I've never seen someone get trained into becoming a 10. Uh, now, if you're 7, you can get up to a 9 or a 10 or something like that. And that's antithetical to almost every leadership book you'll ever read, because all of them say you can be trained in becoming a better leader. I think that has a somewhat vested interest in selling more books, because if everyone could become a leader, then everybody could read the book, right? Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have that view. And so I think some people are just born with the gift. Um, one example, um, I saw Mr. Camp when I came in here. I went to school with his daughter, Mary. She's got more leadership in her little pinky than most people will see in a lifetime. <laughs> she came out of the womb that way, is how I suspect. And then uh, with some cracks over the head over time, she probably became uh, refined and a good leader. And I think that's how it works for most. Mm -hmm. Okay, so. You're, you're in the organization, um, you've done your assessment of somebody's C, D, and E qualities, and that person is chosen. And, you know, when we do assessments, um, we're hopeful, hopefully discerning. A year later, the person isn't cutting it. What's, what happens then? Yeah. Those are tough. Uh, and often, you know, there's a, sometimes it's just my fault, pick the wrong person, and how do we deal with that person gracefully? But um, Every situation is different, but the framework I try to think about this, and this is a little overly simplified, I suppose, but the framework I try to think about it is this. Picture, I suppose I can't draw on that. Is that <laughs> would that be bad? If I could, I would draw a vertical axis here that's what I call what. This is performance. Mm -hmm. This is, you know, and it's difficult. There's no objective, you know, you're a 10, you're, but vertically is performance from not so good to great. And then horizontally is what we call how, and I call that our values. So ideally, if you think of the, like where would you rank someone in a quadrant, the people that have high performance and really good values are in the upper right. That's the easiest of all, right? Promote them as much as you can and throw as much money as we can afford. The bottom left quadrant is equally as easy. Poor performance, no values, fire them as fast as you can and then get legal to cover your butt um, <laughs> in today's world. And that's not as easy as you'd think, yeah. but the decision's easy, right? Uh, fire them as fast as you can. Then you have you know, low performance. The person's underperforming, but they've got great values. They, they stand for what we believe in. Their character, their integrity is high. And if you think about that quadrant right on the bottom right there, uh, those people always get a second chance in my book, and sometimes a third and a fourth and a fifth. It's just a matter of finding the right place on the bus. Mm -hmm the hardest, and I think the part that kills organizations, is the folks who are great performers and poor values. And most companies, and, and we're not immune from this either, most companies give them a pass because they're killing it. Look mm -hmm. at their numbers, look mm -hmm. at their sales let. We try very hard to make those, sure those people get out of the organization as fast as the ones who aren't performing, because how matters as much as what. Mm -hmm. So that framework helps us guide how we want to deal with folks who are in the wrong, the wrong okay. slot. So back to this quadrant over there of high performance but low value or ethic or whatever. Is that a challenge or do people understand when someone like that is, is released? Or do you get a lot of feedback like, did you do the right thing there? What, yeah. how, do, how do people respond to that? 
depending on what particular form of value you're thinking about that we believe them to be uh, missing, mm -hmm. it becomes a very big challenge. Um, if they stole company money, pretty easy. Bye-bye. Mm -hmm. If they're just not a good team player and they're constantly making others look bad to make themselves look good, mm -hmm. it's a little harder to quantify that one. Mm -hmm. And there's a little harder uh, sort of to get assessment that everybody agrees. So depending on what kind of value we're talking about, it becomes very challenging. And it is very tempting and very easy to look the other way on those shades of gray ones because, remember, they're mm -hmm. killing it. Mm -hmm. They're delivering. Mm -hmm. um, we struggle with that. Yeah. Frankly, this is a little more than you want to know probably, what if it's an ace retailer in Podunk, Iowa? I work for them. But we do have the ability to pull the plug on them anytime we want. That's a real challenge and can become difficult. But over time, when we get rid of those folks that don't stand for what ACE represents around the world, uh, it's painful in the moment, but really good over time. Mm -hmm. Good. Back to Jim Collins. He talks about um, the, uh, a component of level five leadership is being specific, methodical, and consistent. Okay? Specific, methodical, and consistent. Yet, <clears throat> we live in a pretty uncertain, fast-changing world, whether it's commerce or whatever your environment. So no matter how unforgiving that environment is, here's someone out there saying that's how we have to lead. What do you think about that? It's, uh, <clears throat> it's probably some of the best counsel in that book, and he has a follow-up book that, that has been written that is very similar, and it talks about this consistent march over time. Mm -hmm. And it, it, every, every generation probably feels this way, uh, but it just seems like the macro events outside of your control continue to get harder. Um, how do I say this without getting into politics? Most of our owners would rather see like less uncertainty, less regulation, and a little lower taxes. Mm -hmm. Most of them, 99%. Um, and yet they feel like that's exactly the opposite of what's happening. Mm -hmm. So whether it be Obamacare, or whether it be wars, or whether it be weather, or whether it be taxes, or, there's all these things outside of your control, and it becomes very easy to sort of wring your hands, complain about that, whine, make excuses. Mm -hmm. And what I think happens is, you get whipsawed by events outside of your control. And I think what Collins is talking about in that book, which is spot on in my view, is in the face of that, you've got to have this long-term view of what we call enduring principles. Our strategy may change, digital technology, oh my goodness, try to keep up with that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> try to keep up with amazon.com, oh my goodness. Um, but despite that, we try very hard to stay away from getting whipsawed by things outside our control and focus specifically on our strategy and the execution of it, aligned around what we think is enduring principles. And I'll just give you two quickly. It may not apply to anybody else's business, but for us, we believe that regardless of what happens outside of our control, regardless of what kind of products Amazon delivers with drones or whatever digital <laughs> technology brings, and we play in all that too, mm -hmm. we believe to our core that physical structures, we call those stores, and human relationships will always matter. Mm -hmm. And we need to make those increasingly relevant as opposed to chasing after Amazon and try to out Amazon, Amazon. They're great at technical service. We're gonna win eyeball to eyeball, belly to belly. Human relationships where neighbors wait on neighbors. We think 100 years from now, that'll still be relevant. That helps guide us when yet another change comes down the pike that we feel can't mm -hmm. control. Now, I'm a believer, right? It's, it's the human relational thing. Jesus came and dwelled among us, right? Now, do you model that or do you tell your, your, your stores that? Or both? It's what? gotta be both. Okay. It's gotta be both. Um, yeah, it's, it's absolutely both. You, preach it until the cows come home, mm -hmm. for sure. And, and I know you may have some questions on communication, so I won't go into that yeah. just yet, but you know, communicating that in a clear, compelling, and, and relevant way is absolutely important. But modeling, it's huge. And listen, I'm almost uncomfortable telling you this, but I'll give you just a little funny story um, to show you how we try to model mm -hmm. it, or at least I do. Um, if my phone rings, I answer it. Sounds pretty, wow, are you impressed? <laughs> 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 but let me just give you a story. We were interviewing, we, our board of directors is made up of our own retailers, and then we have two outsiders that have nothing to do with ACE. We were interviewing a, a senior vice president of uh, McDonald's right across the street from us, thinking he would help be on our board. At the time, he worked for a, a CEO who's retired from McDonald's. When the interview was over, just to entertain myself, because it's about me, um, I said, Jim, tell me, the guy's name is Jim Kramer, not the one you see on TV. Um, Jim, tell me, does your CEO, again, he, his name was Skinner, he's not there anymore. 
But I said, does your, your franchise get a lot of calls? I mean, do they call in a lot? Does Jim get a lot of calls? And he says, what did you just ask me? <laughs> the phone rings. Your CEO gets a call. Is it ever a franchisee? How hard is it? And he says, well, maybe two or three times a year, and probably twice somebody's going to get fired. <laughs> now, I'm not disparaging McDonald's. That's a great franchise, and we can learn a lot from them. I wish we were that big. Um, but it doesn't work that way. Mm -hmm. Our owners aren't franchisees. They're owners, and when they call, I answer the phone. It's a way to try to model it in a small, stupid way. Thankfully, mm -hmm. more people send emails than call these days, so it's a little easier. <laughs> but it's just a way to try to live out what you believe. Sure, good. Now, when you, you've given us a great example of how to be a leader, an authentic leader. How do you shape the communication? How do you decide when communication is necessary? And you already alluded to the fact that you thought I was going to head in this direction. So um, what, how, do you, how is communication a tool in being a leader? It, it, before I answer, let me do, talk about being authentic. Let me be authentic. If you asked our retail owners, if you did a survey of 4850, which we do, the number one thing we get kicked in the fanny on every single year, we don't communicate enough. Mm. Always. So I feel a little hypocritical even answering your question because <laughs> we clearly can improve upon it. So I think about it in two ways. Individually, one-on-one, -on -one, it's just got to be clear and frequent, mm -hmm. and it's never enough. But then organizationally, um, I try to convey this. In fact, I've even used this illustration where, you know, I'll hang up a bucket, you know, from that pole. I'll poke a hole in the bottom. We sell stuff that pokes holes pretty well. <laughs> and I'll just let the stuff drip all over the floor slowly. And every once in a while, I'll go, hey, you know, Adam, could you go fill up the bucket? You know, could you go fill up just over and over to the point where they're, they're sick of it? And I'll make the point, vision's a leaky bucket. You communicated it once, you filled the bucket, and you think you got it. I guarantee by the end of the day, forget about it. They'll have They'll have forgot. So if it's something that's important, mm -hmm. this is sort of my litmus test. If I'm not absolutely sick to my stomach, throw up, nauseated hearing myself talk about it, I probably haven't communicated enough. So we just try to use that as a litmus test to make sure we're doing more and more. And as you can see from our survey results, we're not really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> so more of it is needed, huh? <laughs> yeah. The other side of it, though, that's a frequency comment. The other side of that, <clears throat> this is my own belief, is um, this idea of, of being informal in communication versus formal. And sorry, I got a little chip on my shoulder about this, so if I have a little extra horsepower or blow a gasket, I apologize in advance. But um, one of the things that most people hate about big companies is how bureaucratic and stiff and boring and rote they are. I mean, just read a letter from any company our size or bigger from the CEO, and you'll fall asleep by paragraph <laughs> two. And they're so careful and cautious. And so the, the way I think about it is big is almost always bad. Yeah, it's, it's a bit of a paradox because I want to grow bigger. And mm -hmm. if I don't, they'll find somebody else who can. But big almost always leads to bureaucracy. Mm -hmm. And bureaucracy just suffocates people. I mean, who wants to be around that? Go, look at Washington, D.C. Anybody? How's their ratings? Right? It, big is almost always bureaucratic, whereas small is almost always informal. Mm -hmm. And informality, in my view, liberates people. It frees them up to say what's on their mind and to think things that maybe otherwise they wouldn't, and it's really messy. You know, it produces entropy and it produces messy situations, but it also leads to inventiveness and invention and innovation and growth, and that's exactly what we want. So we try, even though our lawyers don't appreciate it a whole lot, just to be less formal in the way we talk and try to talk like normal people mm -hmm. to normal people. Um, it, it has its pros and cons, but I'll, I'll take that until they tell me to stop. So let me step into the social media world. So Facebook, do you tweet? I mean, what about that world? I personally don't, because Ace isn't about me. Mm -hmm. But we equip our owners to make sure the local owner, who is the owner of this business, is equipped to talk to their consumer however they want to. Mm -hmm. And do we once in a while have to pull something down? When some stinking kid did a zombie video in his Ace store talking about shooting zombies in the face with stuff he bought out of the Ace store, mm -hmm. it's a little messy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> We almost pulled the store number. So that stuff happens. Mm -hmm. But in, in aggregate, mm -hmm. when our local owners are equipped to talk to their local neighbors, and that's what they are, they live in the same communities as those folks, we not only differentiate ourselves from the corporate big boxes, cookie cutter, sterile rote, mm -hmm. we also build relationships because people desire authenticity. Hmm. Good. Now, another factor of communication or future is the feedback loop within the organization. How do you give feedback, both to say those in corporate, um, your owners out there in different communities? How, how does feedback happen? Yeah, again, similar to any communication, right? It's gotta be frequent. Um, 
I think it's a leader's challenge is to decide. Think of it as a, this is, this is a crass analogy, but think of it as a rope. There are times where you just gotta let out rope and let it out as fast as you can because that's the best way you can empower and liberate people to go do stuff. But then there's times you gotta yank on it and give a little mm -hmm. you know, kick. And discerning when to make it taut and when to make it where there's just tons of rope is very difficult, mm -hmm. all right? It's very difficult and it's often messy. But in terms of feedback, that's how I think about trying to deliver it. Mm -hmm. um, and giving rope is easy and pulling it taut is hard. And I think people are naturally wired up to not want to confront. Mm -hmm. uh, it's much easier to talk about you behind your back at the water cooler. But by the way, that's one of our key values, right? Mm -hmm. We talk about that. So anyways, the, the key is to make sure you're doing it frequently, but then decide when it's just praise and load them up with way to goes and add a boys and add a girls. And when mm -hmm. it's time for some candor. Yeah. Now that metaphor of the rope makes us think of a one-to-one. -one. In reality, the workplace is a team, a collaboration of, of, of effort and the like. So how do you understand that? What's the, what's the potential there of working as team? What's the, the challenge? Um, yeah. Tell us your thoughts there. Yeah, t teamwork, th this will probably resonate with this crowd more than most, but teamwork is absolutely critical, especially in our business, my goodness. I mean, just the links in the chain to get the right product to one customer is unbelievable. So teamwork's everything. But teamwork isn't natural. It flies in the face of a person's desire for control and credit and praise, and it comes much more easily to make you look bad, to make me look good, than it does to build you up and make you better. Making your teammates better doesn't come naturally. Now, in this phrase, I could, or in this setting, I could probably use the phrase total depravity. That doesn't work in the marketplace <laughs> quite so much, but we constantly try to show how teamwork isn't natural just because of our natural proclivity to want to get credit and control ourselves. So how do you deal with that? One is to call it what it is. So I, I write about that on a regular basis to anybody that will listen. And then we try to make sure we do a couple things to, to foster it. One, creating a common enemy is really important to us. We are competing. Uh, Business is war in many regards, and you have an enemy, but it isn't each other. We want our competitive juices to flow outside the walls of ACE, not inside. Uh, and in our business, it's pretty easy to find a common enemy. <laughs> there happens to be an internet retailer, I'm sure none of you have heard about, that, that does about $60 billion with a 24% gross margin and has convinced Wall Street they don't need to make any money. That's a tough enemy. <laughs> we want to compete against those kinds of folks, not ourselves. And then two is make sure we brag on any little successes of teamwork. Uh, when I see you building up another teammate to produce a victory, uh, I try to brag on it as much as I can. Um, and in today's world, little handwritten notes and then verbally brazing them and bragging on them in front of others is huge. Mm -hmm. And then we constantly try to use metaphors. So the one I always use that nobody likes, but there are a few privileges, right? So it's, you know, we talk, we've had, we had a great year. We're having a great first quarter. And so we talk a lot about productive paranoia. You know, yeah, we may be big. Yeah, we may be sold $12 billion last year. That's wonderful. It's a record. But listen, we are nothing more than ants. We are not gorillas. Alone, you get squashed on easily. Together, we move stuff we shouldn't be able to. Um, those kinds of things, values need heat. I, my job is to be a Bunsen burner under teamwork. Hmm. Remember that, students, a Bunsen burner under teamwork. And speaking of students, there are many here that um, are preparing for the world of career and leadership. And um, what words of advice do you have for them, especially those who are seniors and doing the job hunt right now? Yeah, so it's hard. Um, I guess, I guess I, if you're in school, you know, it's, um, fun doesn't have to be the enemy of success, but it can be. So you, your job, if you're at school, is, is most notably uh, kept score on your, on your GPA, right? You know, I always say, in business, we keep score with money. You'll never see me apologizing for that. But business isn't about money, it's about people. And then you can go on with your message, right? In school, you know, we keep score mostly on the GPA, right? So you gotta work at it, but it, it doesn't have to be the enemy of fun. Um, but for those of you out there to go get a job, I'd be less than genuine if I didn't say it's, it's gonna be hard. Uh, it's not pleasant out there right now. So I would think of it this way, and forgive me for being overly candid, but you deserve to hear it straight because otherwise you're going to get hit in the head with an anvil and wonder what happened. Your resume, let's say you show up with a, a good resume at the head of HR at ACE takes a look at it and you've done a lot and extracurricular stuff, you got a 3.8 out of 4, whatever. Just know 
right next to it on his desk will be the exact same resume, resume from somebody who probably went to like Harvard or Illinois or Ohio State or Princeton. Um, and right next to that one is gonna be someone who went to an equally impressive school that maybe ended up in the final four and everybody knows who they are. Um, <laughs> and has four years of work experience, but got let off because their company did layoffs. How do you think you're gonna stack up? Am I encouraging you? It's fact. And so I think we talked about this a little bit with the group. You better be focused on that which matters and really counts and be able to position it authentically to differentiate yourself from those other two resumes I talked about. And so you say, well, what matters? Well, obviously your grade point average matters and how you did in school matters and your extracurricular and all that matters. But the stuff that really matters isn't on that scorecard. Your character, your integrity, your ability to get kicked, wiped out, and get yourself back up and dust off and have the grit to go after it again. Your determination, your fire in the belly, your humility, your gratitude for even getting an interview. You've got to be able to convey that in such a way that differentiates you from the person who just has a nice resume because they went to a fancy school. And I would say going to a school like this, you are uniquely positioned to do so, but it's up to you to make sure you do it. I remember when I put my resume together, I sent it to a business guy I knew. This was 20, whatever, three years ago. And they said, it's awfully Christian. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you're going to have somebody who's a Jewish head of HR at the advertising agency you want to go work at. And they're going to see Christian written all over that. You think that's going to help? It may not. You got to decide right there if you're going to try to run from that and be like everybody else or stand apart. And I think if you do that, um, you got a wonderful, wonderful career. Listen, don't get me wrong. College matters. But if you gave me those three resumes and I didn't know who they were, and Steve Timmerman said, listen, I realize all three of these are good, but I've seen this kid work. I've worked with him for four years. I've seen him when nobody's looking. I'd take a bullet for that kid. I'd trust him with my wife or my wallet. I'll take that one. I don't care what your GPA is. So those kinds of things to me ultimately really matter, but somehow you gotta get in the door to convey that sort of stuff because on a piece of paper, it's gonna be tough. This is free of charge. This is like a bonus. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Somebody gave me this line or a version of it and I, and I used it and I call it the magic sentence and I've given it to all my nephews and whatnot and, and uh, I think it matters. Uh, there's going to be a resume and you're going to put a cover letter on top of it, right? And most write a very long-winded, rote, boring resume that everybody else writes the exact same thing. Good luck with that. I do one or two sentences. Attached is my resume. I fully acknowledge other people are going to look more impressive on a piece of paper than me. But I assure you, no one's going to work harder, learn faster, or become more productive sooner than I will. Call if interested. Love to talk to you about it. Get in the door with something not everybody else is going to do. Now, if y'all do that, don't all send them to ACE because I'm going to know. <laughs> you know, that doesn't work. So all I'm saying is that, that the, stu the stuff of what your, your fiber is made of really counts, but it's hard to articulate. I'd spend a lot of time thinking about that versus, you know, what font am I going to put my resume in? Who cares? Yeah. Well, students, don't forget that cover letter um, strategy. So, um, and and I think we get a sense just from from these answers about you, the qualities you bring as a leader: yeah, passion and energy and drive. And um, it's good to know that uh, Ace Hardware understands that, and the, the business continues to flourish. The the group here probably has some questions, and Great. so I think we ought to take some time for their questions. Uh, does Ace Hardware have plans to uh, secure more American-made products mm. to sell at Ace Hardware stores? Mm -hmm. Good question. Yeah, um, I'll be honest with you, we don't get a lot of credit for this, but in comparison to about every other retailer in the world, we're actually a little behind. Um, we do about 300 million of our U.S. 10 billion in volume that's import. Frankly, we probably should have been doing a little bit more of it because uh, it's... Uh, it's a one way to get a low prices. If you don't believe me, go to Menards. Sorry, I had to do that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, we, we, actually, um, we actually have uh, a lot of winds blowing in our favor here. So forgive, this is, we're going to enter Dorkville here for a minute. But you know, Chinese wages going up is very good long term, although it's pressured. So there's a ton of manufacturing coming back to the United States. And right now, our biggest challenge, to show you how important that is, is hiring drivers of our trucks. 
75% of the people that work for Ace Harbor Corporation either work in a distribution center, bust in their hump on our store's behalf, or drive trucks to deliver stuff around the world. And getting drivers to do that is the biggest challenge right now. It's probably over the next 10 years going to be one of the hottest jobs in America. Between fracking and oil and gas benefits here and manufacturing coming back. You saw Warren Buffett bought a big railroad not too long ago. He's not a stupid man. The U.S. manufacturing is going to be uh, increasingly important and I think very good for us long term. But we have a concerted effort not only to make sure we're exploiting that, staffing for it, but then also communicating it to consumers, which you'll probably see an in increasing measure in our store. Um, but frankly, we didn't ride the wave of cheap Chinese products as probably as much as we should and we left some profit on the table. But as I like to tell our board, no, 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 we, we had prescience and foresight. We knew it was coming back, so we wanted to be ready. So <laughs> we probably won't, that's a lie, we probably won't see a huge jump, but you'll probably end up seeing about the same, which is about two or three times as much as most hardline retailers. Hmm. That was way more than you wanted, but it was a good question. Yeah. Front row, Morgan. Okay, um, I have a question that I think some of the grads may be thinking but haven't asked you. Um, if they were to be put in some sort of management position, there's going to most likely be someone underneath them that's significantly older than them and may not take them seriously or may be, you know, really upset that they didn't get promoted and that sort of thing. How does the, what's the best way to handle that sort of situation as a young, incoming, new manager? Great question. Yeah, um, and I guess I'd say it this way. It, if you're successful in rising the proverbial corporate ladder, I hate that phrase, um, it's going to happen. And I'll give you a personal story. Uh, about five years, for reasons I don't understand, mostly because I think our CEO at the time was probably drinking heavily, he put me in charge of logistics and distribution. So again, that's 75% of the employees that work for the company. I had five guys who were direct reports for me, five guys who combined had 198 years of experience in distribution, logistics, and supply chain just at ACE. <laughs> they all had careers before that too. And so I show up and um, I had a lot to tell them. I just acknowledged it. I said, guys, you're gonna forget more by the end of this meeting than I'll ever know about what you do. And so I tried behind the scenes. I, I lost sleep for a long time trying to get smart enough to even ask a good question frankly. Um, I got lucky though. So in my situation, I realized these guys were absolute studs, were unbelievably hardworking, and dear to a Dutch guy's soul, the cheapest men I've ever met in my life. <laughs> um, and so we, had, we were a kindred spirit. And so my job was I defended them. Anything they asked for, I got it for them. And just constantly talk about giving rope. I rarely yanked the the rope, and if I had something I thought was, I would go to one of them I really knew and trusted, he, he knew I wasn't trying to make them look bad, but, and I'd say, is this the stupidest idea you've ever heard in your life, or can I bring this up without these guys physically attacking me? They were big men too, by the way. They were, they were large, <laughs> physically intimidating men. Um, and then interesting, the, the woman who ran it all was at the corporate office, these guys were all in the field, um, was you know, just the best benefit to me ever because she had a similar experience not too long ago. So. The tougher one will be if you see a bunch of things they don't. And now how are you going to address the fact that you're new, you're green, you're naive, and they'll forget more about all this stuff than you'll ever know. I think the first step is acknowledge it. Just say it. Admit it. It's OK. Um, and I'll tell you, there's nobody in the company i got a better relationship with than those guys. Great. Good. Other questions? Uh, you are obviously very energetic, very passionate. Um, where does that come from? Where does that drive, that energy come from? Is it intrinsic? Is it extrinsic? Uh, for you personally, where do you find that energy? So one thing that's very important about passion. Passion alone is not enough. So, and if you don't believe that, uh, watch the early rounds of American Idol. <laughs> Lots of passion, really bad talent. <laughs> you need both. Um, so yeah. I mean, I think everybody's passionate about something. I, I, and if not, please don't send your resume to Ace. Um, <laughs> find what you love to do, and you usually are good at what you love, and you kind of love at what, what you're good at. Now, I'll put an asterisk next to that in the, you know, <laughs> the war to get a job and find one and work in corporate America, if that's the route you're going into, it can be ugly, and you could end up choosing for the short term to do something you don't like in route to something maybe you like more. But, um, you know, this is, should be easier for you than most. 
I assume most of the folks in this room are Christians. That means you believe that the Holy Spirit has gifted you with something supernaturally. That's probably what you ought to go find do, and you're going to have some passion around it. And what most people do, uh, not, not saying in this setting, but most people, they chase after the money, and they find they hate getting up in the morning going to work. They get up, they have some coffee to overstimulate themselves, they go to work, they complain all day until they get home, they go home, they watch TV, they go to bed, and they do the same stupid thing all over again the next day. Oh, what a fun life. And then they get married and inflict all that angst on their wife and have kids and think that's going to solve it. And that's why most people are miserable. Don't chase the money. Chase what you love, acknowledging you're probably still going to need to put some bread on the table. And my guess is you'll end up in a pretty good spot. A little bit of an overgeneralization, but that's the only way I can describe it for you. One last question. Right here in the middle from Dan Harris. He does not get to Our, ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Our local wonderful Ace Hardware guy. Yeah, I'm assuming it. <laughs> Remember, when you hand that mic back, I'll still have a hot mic and you won't. Did you, did, did you say I was your boss? I'm not sure it was that. Uh, Dan owns Ace Stores, so I work for Dan. <laughs> and John's a great leader. I think you, you can see that spirit here in the room today. Um, you know, I, I go to meetings all the time and I see John and the enthusiasm you're hearing today is what he brings to a room of 5,000 people, 5,000 dealers at a meeting. And uh, I commend that. But I also think that, you know, there were probably along the way there were some people that were mentors for you uh, corporately. Who were the mentors for you, John? That's a great question. <clears throat> uh, I'll mention three quick things. One, the, the CEO before me was just full-on irresponsible and gave me way more chances than I deserved. <laughs> um, I'm not sure what got into him, but it worked out good for me. And so I had a, a, my predecessor, and that transition was a gift because it wasn't awkward. I wish he was still there, frankly, and, and I would, you know, that would have been worse for me in a way. But I was lucky to have a guy before me who was just really good leader and confident and secure and didn't define himself by his job. And, uh, what was it, two and a half years ago or whatever, three years ago when they announced he was leaving and, and I was the guy. Uh, he played a lot of golf, let's just say that. I didn't tell the board until now, but he just <laughs> left and that was, that was strategic. He, you know, he, he'd go, all right, so you're the guy, I'm not going to the uh, officer meetings anymore, you know, good luck with that. And it was great, I loved it. Just drop me in the deep end and he did. Uh, we also, shortly before that, had a corporate attorney who we hired, and we just got lucky. This guy's resume is the most impressive thing you'll ever see. I mean, it, it, it was stupid. We just got lucky. He failed at retirement, and we got lucky because he was close, and so we got about two years. I still meet with him on a regular basis. He's the grouchiest, grumpiest curmudgeon you've ever met in your life, but the smartest, best business person I've ever dealt with. And so uh, you can learn from folks. He's not a leader at all, by the way. I mean, he can't motivate and inspire anybody <laughs> at any point. But, <laughs> But if you, have a, if you have a crossroads and you need to know which path to take, go to that guy and he'll go 99 out of 100 times the right path. And then way more than that, and, and this probably isn't a politically correct answer, but um, especially now, I got three buddies at my church who don't have any reason to suck up to me. They, they, they actually don't ever say anything nice to me. Um, <laughs> and it's the only way I feel like I really get the straight to make sure I've got someone who feels comfortable putting their foot in my butt and make sure my character is improving. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not even gonna say good, but headed the right way. And more than any of the mentors I have or have in business, that by far has been the biggest benefit for me, bar none. Right. Thank you. So it's about the body of Christ yes, being sir. part of it. We thank you, and Dr. Hamilton is coming forward right now. At the close of this meeting, I'd like to thank John and Steve for a really interesting interview. It's really a joy to have uh, John come, and on behalf of the college, I'd like to say thank you uh, for participating in this, and uh, you're a troll, and will always be a troll with us, so we just really appreciate that. But also, just as in the sake of change as is happening, President Timmermans uh, announced last week, or is changing in the, on that piece, and I just want to say to my friend Steve, it's just a blessing to have you come into the classroom, help us in this role, and all the many things going on in the transition that you have. Thank you very much for sharing your heart and your spirit with us. Uh, as we talk about leadership in this space. Thank you.